The topic tonight is Lost Christianities. Um, and so just to kind of start out, um, I think that when it's uh, most simply told, um, people have understood the Christian narrative as being essentially there is a church, an original church, uh, founded by somebody named Jesus Christ. And a lot of times people think of that as somebody's name and maybe even with the middle initial Jesus H. Christ, <laughs> you know, depending on how people are thinking about it, first name, last name, which then after his uh, uh, crucifixion and resurrection, um, he uh, it's passed to his apostles. Uh, and they, in turn, ultimately became a bishop, so and appointed uh, successors as bishops, and that eventually spread from the different cities of the Roman Empire till the Emperor Constantine was converted, and then Christianity subsequently became the state religion of Rome. And so it's kind of the simple narrative there of the story. So as we kind of have that here, so we have Jesus of Nazareth, guy in the 30s AD in Galilee, comes to be called the Messiah, which in Greek we have the word is translated Christ, the anointed one, so it's not a um, name but a title, uh, understood to be founding the church by commissioning apostles to go and spread good news or gospel. Next, uh, he predicted his own death and resurrection in the gospel accounts. He's executed by the Romans, returns from the grave. He appears first to his female disciples and then later to his male disciples and apostles. The apostles spread that gospel. Uh, they are all Jews. They spread it first to other Jews uh, and begin to convert them to become Christians. Afterwards, they begin to convert Gentiles, as they as they were called, essentially, which means Greek-speaking pagans or Aramaic-speaking pagans of the Roman Empire. Uh, all of those apostles are martyred, just like Jesus was. Uh, meanwhile, the apostles have founded individual congregations, and some of them have become bishops. So Peter uh, is ultimately first bishop of Antioch in the tradition, and then ultimately bishop of Rome um, in the tradition. And then they otherwise appointed successors and other overseers, or as we, we, now, we call them bishops now. And so this is, again, kind of the narrative as it's kind of simply told. And so from there, then, all across the empire, um, the blue areas, the dark blue areas, essentially the urban spaces is where it grows first and then later spreads to the countryside, um, especially after it becomes an official state religion is when the, it finally spreads all the way through everything. Um, and in part, uh, this is why then we have the modern word we call the, the old religion of the empire, we call it paganism because uh, the pagani are the people out in the countryside. It originally, originally just means uh, it's a it's a negative term that means essentially rube or rustic or yokel or something like that in Latin, but it comes to mean polytheist, right? Because the only people that are the yokels that are out in the countryside are the people who still believe in the old gods. So this narrative is definitely um, the narrative as the early bishops understood it. Um, I think that they believed that this is what had happened too, uh, but it also is a narrative um, that they, uh, it, it, they also promoted it. <laughs> and it also, by the way, is in their self-interest to promote, <laughs> you know, since because the bishops uh, found themselves to be in charge of all of these churches. Uh, and so this explained why they were in charge, and it explained uh, that them being in charge is the way it's supposed to be, right? So essentially, then, from the bishop's perspective, let's just making this into a kind of a diagram, um, the mainline church, as it had always existed, comes from Christ uh, through bishops and is the church. And from the perspective, then, of the bishops, um, people who aren't obeying the bishops and who have, let's say, different ideas and who um, aren't uh, agreeing with the creeds and everything else that the bishops agree upon in their ecumenical councils, those people from their perspective then are heretics. And the bishops see them as breaking off then from the real church and rebelling against it and, and starting a heresy. And so this is kind of their perspective and how they wrote it. Um, however, um, so we're gonna switch. Uh, yeah. This microphone's not working. Okay. Um, walk around less and try to talk on this microphone more. Is this one working? I'll talk on this microphone now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, don't, don't do it like that. Just push it. Like that. There you go. So we could go up then. 
I'm not supposed to point it upward. Okay. <laughs> Lots of technical fun this today. Thank you, guys. Um, this narrative, this simple narrative, essentially is written retroactively. So it's written once we already have the bishops, and they're looking back, and this is how they're seeing, uh, seeing this framework from the Episcopal framework, right? So uh, what we always find out whenever we um, open the hood on history is that the, the, the actual, once you get some details, the, the actual details are going to be much more complicated and <laughs> make the story much more complicated than the simple narrative that we end up with. And that's going to be the case with the earliest Christianities here. Um, and so just for what we'll talk about uh, in terms of some of these tonight, um, as early Christianities, I'm dividing them into four groups that we'll touch on, and there's others. Uh, the one being the Proto-Orthodox group, the others being the Ebionites, the Marcionites, and the Gnostics. Hello. <laughs> um, so before, in the second century, these are all groups that are existing in the second century. Then. And so before Constantine, there's no uh, one single church structure, no central authority. Uh, as our earliest sources... Um, as of our earliest sources, there are already multiple competing Christianities, and we have, uh, they are each writing different texts. We have different texts that have different perspectives, and so we can tease it out of the texts. Uh, and although these people who we call proto-Orthodox, they ultimately win, and so they ultimately have their version of the religion become the state religion of the Roman Empire, um, there, there are... We don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily mean that, they're, uh, that their perspective is right, you know. Oh, sorry. Is this microphone? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so looking at these different groups, the Proto-Orthodox, who, like I say, are ultimately the people who are going to win, they end up with a complex Christology where Jesus is fully human and fully divine. I'm sorry, fully divine. A complex theology. They have this idea that the Father, Jesus, and the Spirit are God, but Jesus is not the Father or the Spirit, and so on. So this complication, complicated doctrine of the Trinity that we've talked about every once in a while. And um, they are specifically monotheist, so um, even though they have three persons in one God, they're very serious about the idea that it's only one God. So it is not as opposed to that as, let's say, a dualism, where there is a f two competing forces, as in Zoroastrianism, where there's essentially a source of a good God and also a source of evil uh, God. If any, so the God, the the t equation, for example, of um, the force of evil with Satan, Satan is simply a, m a much lower figure, so it's not God. It's a, a fallen angel. So uh, we go then from the Proto-Orthodox here then to the Ebionites. The Ebionites are Jewish Christians. Uh, they primarily live in Palestine in the east, and they continue to practice Mosaic law. So uh, they are doing things like for example, circumcision that the other Christians have abandoned and some of the other practices, dietary practices and that sort of thing. Um, they themselves have a gospel that's related to Matthew maybe and, may, and they have other gospels that are not related. Um, and they do not think that the Paul, Apostle Paul's uh, teachings, are, they don't consider Paul to be an apostle at all actually. And so they don't consider his teachings to be authoritative or scriptural and so that they would not be using those they wouldn't go into their New Testament. New Testament hasn't been created at this point yet. Um, ultimately, this group is going to be condemned as heretics, and they're going to die out in, within the empire. Next, the Marcionites. These are Christians who are dualists. Um, so they are Hellenists, so they're Greeks. Uh, they are primarily converted from among um, people who had been Greek pagans. They are also not particularly um, excited about or interested in the Jewish inheritance that Christianity has. Uh, and so um, the Marcionites pretty much consider Paul to be the main founder, the most important um, thinker in Christianity. And Marcion um, 
is one of the people who's credited, in fact, with creating uh, the, the first Christian canon. And he makes a very limited, exclusive canon where the only parts of the, of the scripture that will be considered scripture for Marcionites are 10 of Paul's letters and edited portions of the Gospel of Luke, which is the very most uh, Greek gospel. And so uh, the rest of it doesn't count. So you, in, in Mark, no. John, the Gospel of John, no. And none of the other, none of none of the other letters or anything like that is considered um, canonical for the Marcionites, including the Old Testament. Um, they are dualist believers in a battle of good versus evil, and they specifically identify um, the the evil god, the god that is um, in charge of the force of evil, as the god of the Old Testament. And so um, they're saying that as you read the Old Testament, uh, Marcion believed none of the things that, are the, uh, that God is doing, like causing the flood and things like that, are, can be reconciled as far as Marcion is concerned with the Heavenly Father that Paul is talking about, a God of good and justice and things like that. And the, one of the things that Marcion, the ways that he um, did that was insisting uh, that unlike how he reads his own scriptures, um, the Old Testament had to be, the Hebrew Bible had to be read literally, <laughs> which you know, already uh, Hellenistic Jews had not been doing. So they've already been reading that very symbolically. But Marcion said, no, when he, everything in this story has to be written, read as an actual literal story. So for example, when we hear God is walking around in the Garden of Eden and he can't find Adam and Eve, that's because he is a limited physical being with a body who walks around in gardens and doesn't know where Adam and Eve are. <laughs> so in other words, he's not omnipotent and omnipotent. He is a, a, a flawed, evil God. So. Oh, let's, um, how are we doing that? How are we doing questions, Landro, with this microphone like this? How are we doing questions with this microphone like this? <laughs> Shall I repeat them? I'll just repeat them. Go ahead, Urchin. When did Marcion live? So this is, um, this is all talking about second century, and we'll, we'll have a whole slide on Marcion. It's essentially from 100 to uh, 160 AD, I think, is Marcion's time frame. So the early second century. And finally, oh, I'm sorry, Jane had a question. Do they reject the idea altogether that Christ is the same prophecy as John the Baptist? Right, yeah, exactly. So this is another thing even. So, so by, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, so the question was, do the Marcionites reject the idea then that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies? And uh, the answer essentially is yes. They're, they're really rejecting the, the Jewish inheritance, and they're really kind of trying to take this in a, in a new way by purging as much as possible. And so you can imagine why this didn't take, right? <laughs> because if you read through even Paul and you read through uh, Luke, which are the parts of the Marcionite canon that they have, there is a lot of references. Jesus is talking about the Old Testament and things like that. It is hard to to square the whole thing, you know. And why should a Marcionite who has helped them utterly destroy Isaiah read the same? So the, yeah, they had to. The question is, they they have to make some other story of where Jesus came from. So Jesus, uh, in the for the Marcionites, is. Uh, the son of the true heavenly father, right? The good heavenly father, uh, but is not. But that God is the God of the New Testament, not the God of the Old Testament. So essentially, there's two gods: there's the good one and the evil one. Uh, and the evil one is the is and as that kind of starts happening. So that I when that with that idea out there, and the Marcionites throwing that out there, that brings us to our fourth one, which are the Gnostics. And so with that kind of basic idea out there of a dualistic force, um, now there are um, a, other thinkers, and we'll talk about some of them, who then say, well, we need, like you say, we need more scripture to figure this thing out, <laughs> you know, because we're not get, we don't have enough just in Paul and just in Marcion's uh, um, New Testament in order to get at this. And so the Gnostics, um, drawing on all sorts of traditions, including Platonism, uh, other mystical traditions, they formulate lots and lots and lots of new Christian scriptures. And so, and we'll look at some of those. Uh, but essentially that creates kind of elaborate uh, mythologies based on 
um, in the same way that kind of Plato has the, these analogies of the cave. So there's their, what they're trying to do is they have a kind of a cosmological sense of how the world got to be the way it is and between this good God and the evil God. And uh, then they create a whole series of uh, mythological stories that tell that. And most importantly for the Gnostics, the, that information is a secret, <laughs> and it is only available to the people that are in the in-group. So uh, essentially, they could just go to a regular Christian church, and as far as they're concerned, as the Gnostics are concerned, you know, you're just hanging out with all these guys, and they're all the dupes as far as you're concerned, because you're the in-group. You're the secret, the groups that have the secret knowledge, and you know what this stuff is really about, and you might just share that within your church you know, as part of an in, a in click or something like that. So whereas the Marcionites and the Ebionites have their own different separate churches and groups, the, the Gnostics are kind of intertwined with this whole thing, and it's very hard to um, separate them out for the other groups. Um, in this case, too, the Gnostics then, they are rejecting the idea that uh, Jesus is human at all, uh, and so um, and instead, um, because... They have a sense that, um, a more elaborated sense than Marcion had, that the evil God has created all physical matter and that uh, the good God is the God of spirit and mind and idea. So the Platonic ideals as opposed to um, the physical world that we're all trapped in with the cave. <laughs> uh, because of that, um, Jesus, who is essentially a son, uh, a, a, a redeemer from the good God, the real creator, um, never really had was physical, but just had a physical appearance to everybody. And so therefore was also never really crucified, all that kind of thing. So we'll see that in their scripture. Yes, Jane. So the question is, are Gnostics related to the Zoroastrians? And so... One of the ways that there's a relationship here is it's a relationship of ideas. And so Zoroastrianism, uh, the religion of the Persian Empire that had already been going on now for um, the better part of a millennia, uh, depending on how, anyway, how more recently, anyway, 600 years or so, the, um, the, the, has been influencing Judaism and Eastern, uh, the Eastern part of the empire. Um, it's dualistic. And so those ideas are there, and um, and so in that way they're they're they've they're buying into that same idea. So the so the Zoroastrianism, um, the reason for dualism is uh, one of the re points of answering the question why do the righteous suffer? Right. So this is this ultimate th question of the problem of evil. Uh, the problem of evil isn't as big a deal if you're a pagan, if you're a polytheist, because the gods are pretty chaotic. And you may be really good with one God or something like that, and you've done all the right things, but you forgot to cross your fingers when you did something else, and some other God then is upset, upset or offended. And so that's why, you know, you, um, your stocks went down today. <laughs> you know, and so that, that's easy to understand. You, even though you're righteous and you've been doing all the things you were supposed to be doing with, with Athena, you know, you have completely pissed off Poseidon for some reason, right? So in polytheism, it works pretty easily. For when you get to monotheism, and you have Yahweh, you have the God of Israel, um, and you feel like you have really done everything. You know, there's like a lot of laws here, and you have, you know, you've followed them all, and yet somehow um, uh, the, the, the Ptolemies or Seleucids you know, actually come in and, and smash God's temple in Jerusalem again and put a, an idol to Zeus in it, and you wonder, wait a second, why did that happen to us? We shouldn't, that shouldn't be happening to us because we were righteous. We shouldn't have... Uh, and so you, you, you question, why do the righteous suffer? Well, Zoroastrianism has a great answer for that, um, which is there's an evil God, <laughs> you know? And so the, you're, the good God, you know, is in um, constant cosmic conflict with the evil one. The evil one is causing all of these misfortunes and everything like that. And, the, and this is one of the reasons why also Zoroastrianism is apocalyptic, which is to say sometime in the future, good is going to triumph. And then there'll be a new world where there isn't evil anymore. And that has influenced Judaism in general in the Second Temple period, and it's definitely influenced Christianity. But this is one more level of influence, which is to say they have this dualistic um, 
uh, theology for the Gnostics and the Marcionites. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So just as we're kind of going through this then, so we have, um, we kind of know where Christianity is going to get to in the fourth century when Constantine converts, he sets up a structure, there's the universal councils, the creed, the trinity, all those wonderful things, you know, of the triumphant triumph of what we'll call the Orthodox Catholic Church. So the early Christian church, the official church, before it splits into the east and west. And we know that then in the second century, there were a bunch of these different Christianities um, that I've just mentioned, these four t ones. So what came before that in my, <laughs> in my yellow dot here, question mark? Um, what was, what, how did we get to this uh, situation in the second century where there's very different Christianities between, um, you know, dualist Gnostics, <laughs> the proto-Orthodox people, and uh, the Jewish Christians who, you know, all have very different views of who Jesus is and, and what's going on. You had a question? I was wondering about the catacombs, you know, the small crypt that you have in the ground. Yes. So the question is, yeah, about the, um, so even like from my first title slide, I have a picture, it was a fresco of um, Jesus and teaching the apostles. It's a very early one. Jesus doesn't even have a beard in it. <laughs> and so a lot of early pictures, you know, people didn't settle in on the iconography of exactly what Jesus looks like uh, until later. Um, and so there are, um, in, this, is in, this is in Rome, and so there are places where during persecutions, Christians are meeting underground in the, in the different catacombs. Um, the persecutions are not, um, sometimes people, we think of um, this time period in the earliest Christianity, so let's say from the time when Jesus is crucified all the way up until Constantine, we sometimes think of that as just being like this one long period of time when Christianity is this um, persecuted religion where the Romans are just constantly finding a Christian and then they throw him to the lions, you know, and so they're, or whatever, and so, but in fact, um, that's only occasionally happening. <laughs> And it's usually only happening um, in limited areas. And so there'll be like a periods of persecution under particular emperors at particular times in particular places. Largely, um, the Romans generally tolerated um, Christianity or Christians practicing. They didn't worry about it. Uh, and so that, that level of, um, to, if you, to get thrown to the lions, you kind of had to want it to happen. <laughs> as an early Christian, and there's a bunch of early Christian sources we have where the early Christians kind of do want that to happen. <laughs> and so in part, it's because they um, see emulation of Jesus's martyrdom as the model of um, kind of Christian righteousness and salvation, and they refuse to compromise. And so they, and so essentially what they'll do is the Roman, uh, a Roman noblewoman like St. Perpetua is brought up and she has been denounced as a Christian and she's a Christian, and the law is that you have to um, offer a sacrifice uh, before the genus of the emperor. So essentially for the imperial cult. It's essentially saying, I pledge allegiance to the flag, right, if you're an American. So if you have to, it's like essentially you have to stand up, you have to say the Pledge of Allegiance and salute the flag is pretty much what, what the Romans are actually asking you to do. Uh, so all that... Um, Perpetua has to do is take a little thing of incense and like go like this, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> and so, and the governor is like telling her, you know, that's all you got to do. And then, and then if you don't do it, and so, well, I'm going to whip your father, your poor old father, until you do it. And so they do that for a while. She still won't. <laughs> and so then they finally have to anyway. They they finally have to throw her to the lions. But any, because she doesn't want to compromise and say that by doing that that she's um, um, a polytheist, right? Uh, but in general, um, the Romans aren't actually going around and asking you that. And so we have letters from Pliny to the emperor. Should we go around and should I be seeking them out? And the emperor's like, no, <laughs> do not seek them out. You know, and what about if people um, write uh, secret denouncements where you send a list? Oh, I know that these guys are all Christians. And he's like, no, don't listen to those. <laughs> so it has to, they really had to not go out of their way to do it. So, so I would just say in that way, the persecution isn't all a full-time thing, but there are, are Christians getting murdered for sure. But it's not, um, and sometimes the, the Romans are out rounding people up, but it's not all the time. Okay. 
So difficulties constructing, so getting to that yellow dot. So what was happening in the first century? We have a bunch of difficulties in reconstructing the earliest Christianities uh, because outside of the movement itself, what well, we're going to say early, the earliest Christians and their precursors, nobody in the Roman Empire thought that Christianity was important or noteworthy. They are not, this is not front page news. This is not uh, uh, something that all the historians are talking about. Um, outside of Christian sources, mentions even are very few and brief. Um, the earliest Christian sources we all, that we do have then, uh, which are main and best sources, are partisan. They're written after there's already considerable evolution in the movement, and they're also factionalized, so they're not all on the same side as each other. And they're all not histories either, so they're not trying to write the history. They're, generally speaking, they're often trying to convert people to Christianity, <laughs> you know, so they, they have a different agenda than trying to tell us how this movement got started or trying to... If they, even if they are trying to tell us that, they're not trying uh, academically to find out how it happened. They're just telling the story as they already know it. Okay, so the um, best or the primary um, um, non-Christian source that we have is Josephus. So Josephus is uh, what this incredible resource we have for all things uh, in terms of Jewish history of this time period, of the Second Temple period. Um, so he is a Roman Jewish uh, historian who is commissioned by the emperors uh, of the Flavian dynasty who came to prominence because they were the leaders of the Roman legions during the first Roman Jewish war. And so they are the, the generals who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and everything like that. Uh, they employed Josephus then to write a history of what happened. Uh, he Writing in the 70s to 90s, he's... Um, pretty much our best source that we have on this stuff. Um, in voluminous writings, however, uh, he has just three scant mentions of leaders of the proto-Christian movement, and in every case, they're written as asides. So he's talking about something else, and he just mentions uh, these guys as, as to, tell, to make a point to something else he's talking about in every case. Um, at least one of these um, mentions uh, is contaminated by later Christian interpolation. And what that means is um, we don't have any original texts of any ancient sources unless somebody buried them in a, in, a, um, in a jar and we found them in the Dead Sea or we found them buried in Egypt somewhere. In general, um, what we have are copies of copies of copies of copies of ancient books and the people that copied them are medieval monks, right? And so uh, the only reason why any Roman sources have come down to us is because medieval Christian monks liked that book uh, and sometimes it, they couldn't help but um, make it better <laughs> as they were making their own copy of it. And that happened, unfortunately, with Josephus in one of the cases, as we've talked about in previous uh, lectures. So we'll just go through what Jesus has to, I'm sorry, what Josephus has to say uh, uh, in his three brief asides about uh, early Christian leaders. So first he talks about uh, Guy John the Baptist, and he writes, now some of the Jews thought that the destruction of Herod's army came from God. And this is a confusing thing in this time period. Um, a lot of the leaders are all um, uh, part of this Herodian dynasty, and usually everybody just always calls them all Herod. <laughs> but this is not Herod the Great who had built Herod's temple and all those sort of things. So that famous Herod that's the king when Jesus is born, according to uh, Luke's and Matthew's story. Um, this is his son, Herod Antipas, who is a lesser leader. He's a tetrarch, which means he's ruler over a fourth of what his father had had. Uh, and so he is in charge specifically of Galilee and Perea. So he's in charge of the area where um, Jesus uh, was from. So there's some of the Jews thought that the destruction of this particular Herod's army came from God and that very justly as a punishment of what he did against John that was called the Baptist. So here's a guy, John the Baptist. For Herod slew him who was a good man. Herod, who feared lest the great influence John had over the people, might put it into his power and inclination to raise a rebellion. Accordingly, he was sent as a prisoner out of Herod's suspicious temper to Machaerus, to the castle I mentioned before, and there he was put to death. And so the idea here is that there is a guy called, called a baptizer, and he uh, has some kind of uh, popularity, and to the point where um, 
the local leader here, political leader, decided, well, might as well just, you know, get rid of this and not have it, not have a potential for a rebellion, right? And so he kills him. Okay, next. Uh, this is Josephus on Jesus, and this is after I've pre-stripped out the Christian interpolations. Uh, this is not, um, this is controversial because some people think that the whole passage has been, uh, is, is been added. Um, I tend to agree that um, the parts that I took out of it are the parts where the Christians very obviously added and that if you take their stuff out that this reads pretty reasonably like Josephus. But anyway, whether or not this is, it's not, not really the point. I just kind of want to show it as um, what we're saying at the time of what people maybe think is noteworthy of, of, of this earliest movement. So Josephus writes, or probably wrote, about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of such people as accept the truth godly. He won over many Jews and many of the Greeks. And when, upon the accusation of the principal men among us, Pilate had him condemned to a cross, uh, those who first came to love him did not cease, and the tribe of Christians, so-called after him, has still to this day not disappeared. So there's a guy, his name Jesus, uh, he's a teacher and also a, um, a doer of surprising deeds, maybe a magician, a wonder worker, and uh, killed by Pontius Pilate, and uh, people after him, so uh, who are both Greeks and Jews, uh, have come to call themselves Christians or have been called Christians as far as, by Josephus' time. And then finally, um, more obscure figure for the rest of us, um, but an interesting one here for Josephus to be singling out. So in a little bit longer story, um, this younger Ananus, who he told you already took the high priesthood, so this is the high priest of Jerusalem. Um, Ananus was a bold man in his temper and very insolent. He was also of the sect of the Sadducees. So he's part of this priestly caste um, in Second Temple Judaism. When therefore Ananus was of this disposition, he thought he had now a proper opportunity. So Festus, the local Roman guy who was overseeing the area, is dead. And then the other guy, the other Roman who might stop <laughs> Ananus from doing anything, he was out, out on the road. So in other words, the, his, the, the cat is away. <laughs> and so now the, uh, the high priest is going to play. And so, um, so he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges. So he's getting the local um, religious authorities in Jerusalem and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James. So James, the brother of Jesus, and some others. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. But as for those who seemed the most equitable of the citizens and such as were the most uneasy at the breach of the laws, they disliked what was done and also sent to the king, desiring him to send to Ananus that he should act uh, no more so. So act so no more. So essentially, um, he, Ananus here has taken the opportunity when he has no oversight to get rid of a local enemy, somebody he doesn't like. And so essentially there is this guy uh, the James, the brother of Jesus, and he's stoned, according to Josephus here. Yes? Can you see that from any sense of uh, an obvious interpolation just because of the slide being at the back? Yeah, I, I should have probably had kept that slide in. I just always feel like there's maybe too many slides. I'll go back one. The question was, can I tell what the interpolations had been? So these ones, this one here doesn't have one. Uh, this one is a very, I, I find it hard to believe that this would be interpolated because um, James, the brother of Jesus, isn't important in the later Christian story. He's more important in the early Christian story. And I think he is important at this time period, and so I think it's something that Jesus, Josephus might mention. Um, but the previous one, <laughs> this is the place where uh, the Christians did mess it up, uh, uh, I think, inarguably. In and so the way the text reads here, I, I've taken all those dot, dot, dots. So all those dot, dot, dots is where I've taken Christian stuff out. So about this time there lived Jesus, a wise man, and then the Christians wrote in here, if indeed he should be called a man at all or something like that. <laughs> you know, for he was one who performed surprising deeds and was a teacher of the people who accept proof gladly. He won many, over many Jews and many of the Greeks. And then the Christians write in here at this point, he was the Christ, <laughs> you know, and he, you know, uh, 
uh, and he and he was resurrected and that kind of thing. So in other words, so they include all of this kind of Christian st uh, stuff that doesn't sound like Josephus. But if you take it out, this passage reads like you know, like before, and something you would imagine him saying. You know, because even here, we're even calling him. He's like saying called the Christ. So he's, Josephus is kind of not, he's not saying he believes Jesus is Christ, right? He's saying so-called Christ. That's what these Christians are calling him. Okay. So, uh, so for Je Josephus, as far as he's concerned about this movement, <laughs> he doesn't talk about it. He's not like he's saying um, there is four or five sects of, of Judaism. There's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and these Christian guys. They're not mentioned. But what he is saying here is that the, he's identified three people that we know of as early Christian leaders, and he's more or less saying these are, there's three guys who got killed for various political reasons during this war, warring time period of the first century uh, of the common era. John the Baptist, Jesus called the Christ, and James, the brother of Jesus, called the Christ. And I just wrote in here, we, we tend to call him, in retrospect, he's called James the Just, or James the less, and we only say that because there's so many Jameses. <laughs> and so it's as opposed to James the Greater, um, for example, who's another James. There's a bunch of James, the son of Zebedee. There's a bunch of different Jameses in the, in the Christian story because there's only so many names. Everybody's named John, or actually a lot of them are named Judas. <laughs> and so some of them are called Judah, some of them Judas, Jude, but it's all the same name. Yes. So the question is, um, how, why does Jesus have a brother? <laughs> is, isn't Mary a virgin? Uh, you know, where does this brother come from? Uh, and so this is... <laughs> so, so there's different ways that people have worked that out. <laughs> the, the ultimately, the, pro, the proto-Orthodox answer, the way the proto-Orthodox people deal with uh, the fact that Jesus has more than one brother, actually, there's multiple um, brothers of Jesus that are mentioned, and sisters of Jesus that are mentioned in the canonical Christian New Testament. Uh, so there's multiple brothers and sisters mentioned. So the, the other one is Jude, for example, is the brother of James, the brother of Jesus, and there's a couple more that are mentioned. Um, the way that the Proto-Orthodox resolve that is that they say that Joseph was an old man by the time he married Mary. Mary was a virgin as far as the Proto-Orthodox are concerned. Uh, she had Jesus and continued to be a virgin her entire life, and that never, never changed. Uh, meanwhile, Joseph had had a previous wife. He was a widower, and he had all these, um, he had all these sons. And so, the, so they're the half. As far as um, as far as the proto-orthodox are concerned, they're the half brothers and sisters of Jesus, and not the good half, <laughs> not the you know this kind of stepdad half part, right? Um, but that is not how all of the early Christians saw it, and that's not going to be how, for example, um, that's not going to be how the Ebionites see who, who James, the brother of Jesus, is. So we'll just say that's just how they en ends up getting answered um, by, by tradition in the group that wins. Okay, so we have then these martyred leaders of the, I'm calling the proto-Christian movement, this early um, group, uh, which initially isn't calling themselves Christian at first. So we even have in the canonical New Testament the idea that it's not only until after um, Paul gets going for a while and they create a, a community of these believers in Antioch that the name Christian is first assigned to uh, the people. So obviously not in the time period of John the Baptist or J Jesus when they're alive is anybody being called a Christian. So I'm saying proto-Christian. So the, we have these th three leaders here, John the Baptist, Jesus of Nazareth, James the Just. So John the Baptist, um, who is this? So uh, from the, from the uh, earliest accounts that we have, which are the, the um, New Testament ones, we have the idea that John is an ascetic who you know, is a guy living out in the desert. He's wearing skin. He's uh, eating locusts and honey. Uh, he is essentially preaching a renunciation of the world. His message is repent, which is to say, turn your life around entirely, change your life, what you're doing. And, and it's because there's an imminent apocalypse coming. So essentially the world that it exists right now of injustice is going to come to an end. And God is going to bring about an incredible change. And we're going to live in the, um, a world where, uh, where the peaceable kingdom, the reign of God on earth is going to occur. 
He promotes a ritual of being immersed uh, in water. Specifically, he does it in the River Jordan. Uh, and it's different from uh, the uh, ritual bathing for purity that is contemporary to Second Temple Judaism, although it's probably based on the idea of it, uh, where the people would bathe in um, uh, very periodically if you were a priest or if you were uh, specifically priests, um, or if you're trying to live a priestly life. Um, there would be different w reasons why just in natural life you incur impurity, and this is a way for ritual purification for certain uh, things that priests have to do. Um, but in this case, uh, this is for everybody, and it's possibly a one-time only deal, and it possibly is, um, is very different because we're not talking about ritual impurity that comes from... Um, be, let's say touching a dead body or any other kind of number of things that ritual happen for ritual impurity, but rather it's because of uh, being in a sinful condition, and now you are reconciled with God because your sins are are, are redeemed. This was a question. Yes. So the question is, um, what sect? did uh, maybe John the Baptist or maybe Jesus belong to. There are a lot of people who uh, would like to, we don't know for sure is what we, this is the short answer. There are a lot of people who would like to equate John the Baptist as being an Essene. So Josephus, again, our main source on all this, um, says that there are three main sects of Second Temple Judaism, uh, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes. Um, but the number of people in Second Gen Temple Judaism who were Jews, almost none of them would be any of those. <laughs> Uh, they would, because they, um, those are just more or less the tiny groups of the leaders that would be thinking of themselves as being those. Um, so the Essenes are also incredibly popular because of the, not only because Josephus talks about them and we have their name, but because of Qumran, so because of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so as a result of that, we know so much more about the Essenes than we otherwise might. And so people have thought, well, John the Baptist is living right next to them. Uh, the Essenes are are very worried about ritual purity. They're very apocalyptic. They definitely believe in like multiple messiahs are coming. Um, they are really obsessed with ritual purity and they have a lot of these baths that they're doing all the time. And so for a lot of people, they've made that equation and say, well, maybe John the Baptist is a runaway Essene. <laughs> uh, and it's possible, he could be. So in other words, he could have come from that sect. We don't know though, that's just a, this, that's speculation we can't say. So, um, uh, okay, so other, what else do we, what do we know about him? So he lives in the desert, he teaches disciples, and he baptizes Jesus of Nazareth. Um, the Gospels uh, mention that he continues to have ex ex disciples after he's executed by Herod. So the Christian sources and Josephus agree that uh, Herod Antipas executes the guy. Okay. Now, uh, so in like er the early 30s. Before Jesus, yep. Uh, just a little bit before Jesus. So next, uh, Jesus. So from what we can see in the sources, and it's hard, so one of the things when we try to get at the historical Jesus is there are multiple ways that uh, you can make scholarly arguments for what, the, what are the characteristics, and so I'm trying to keep the picture fairly minimal here. Uh, but in contrast to John, who was his predecessor, uh, he apparently has re rejected extreme asceticism. So there is a passage in Matthew um, where Jesus is accused of, uh, by his critics anyway, uh, he, he, he says essentially the son of man uh, didn't, fa he said John came fasting and he got criticized for this and that. Uh, Jesus came, you know, not doing that. And so he got criticized by being called a drunkard and, uh, and a glutton. <laughs> So in other words, he's not fasting, and there's other places where he says, well, the time for, why don't people, John's disciples come and ask him, why don't you and your disciples fast? And he says, well, the time for fasting isn't now, kind of thing. So in other words, this is a, an, a thing that uh, the early Jesus movement is um, embarrassed about because they think it's purer to have done fasting and things like that. That's certainly what John is doing, and that's certainly then also what James the Just does. Um, but it apparently was known that Jesus wasn't all about that. Uh, we also don't really have um, a lot of emphasis on, on Jesus going around baptizing anybody. There is a reference uh, in the Gospel of John, which is pretty late, the 
rest of them. There's not a lot of talking about Jesus, let's say, going and baptizing all of his disciples or something like that, the way John did. Uh, rather, uh, we see him teaching wisdom in parables uh, to sets of disciples. Uh, these include male and female, and he is primarily doing that running around this area of Galilee, which is the northern part of Palestine. He's um, called, uh, he called the poor fortunate, so blessed are the poor is how it's translated often into English, and taught them that, uh, and taught everyone that God's kingdom and the God's kingdom of the last is going to be first. Uh, it's pretty down on wealth usually, actually. <laughs> Uh, in general, then, he rejects legalism and social convention. He says things even as, as extreme as, you know, let the bed, dead bury the dead. So you need to be worrying, not worrying about, uh, you know, all these kind of conventions. You need to be worrying about uh, what really matters. And uh, has a, a reputation as being a healer and an exorcist, right? Okay. James the Just. This is probably the figure maybe you've heard le least about because, again, he becomes less important in the main line of Christianity, the path that goes forward. The brother of Jesus, he's called the just uh, in the sense here of being law-abiding because he's very strict about the law. <laughs> so as opposed to um, Jesus, who we have all of these uh, stories anyway in the Gospels, of Jesus doing things that maybe were, are in contravention of the of, of Mosaic law, or where he seems to be um, doing things like healing on the Sabbath, or doing things that people question, what, should he be doing that kind of thing on Sunday, or not Sunday, on the Sabbath, Saturday. Uh, uh, that is not true for James <laughs> the Just. So he is uh, very law by his devotion to Jewish law. He's uh, uh, the author of the epistle of James, so it's a, a letter that is written as if James the Just wrote it. We don't think it's probably likely that he wrote it, but anyway, it's from his uh, group claiming his authority. Um, has him teach many of the same sayings uh, that Jesus, that are attributed to Jesus in the Gospels without attributing them to Jesus. <laughs> so this is sort of a strange thing. <laughs> Uh, what we essentially had, we've seen other places where um, one of the things that in the earliest uh, Christian writings that we have, uh, there was, for example, this sayings gospel that we had a lecture on that we called Q, that, that uh, both Luke, the author of Luke and the author of Matthew had access to these sayings of Jesus. And essentially, it'll be some kind of a collection of sayings like, um, you know, knock and it'll, it'll be open to you, ask and you shall receive. Those kind of, um, those kind of sayings. And James is another independent source for those, but it doesn't say, James doesn't say, remember that Jesus taught, blah, blah, blah. He just says it. <laughs> and so what might be the case is, in the same way that in the sayings Gospel Q, we have records of not only the sayings of Jesus, but also the sayings of John, the Baptist. Uh, so both those are kind of preserved. It may be that in this early movement, um, that there are multiple people like John and James uh, and Jesus who are all sort of teaching these kind of things and that the sayings are maybe more important than the focusing just on Jesus, let's say. Uh, he is the leader of the early Christians in Jerusalem after Jesus' death. Uh, and that we have from both Paul and uh, from Luke and other sources, um, Josephus as we saw. And that group is specifically a mendicant group um, that is called the poor, who are kind of living this ascetic life where they're sharing all their property such as they have it in common. So they are really trying to live this uh, council that we kind of see in kind of the more radical teachings of Jesus, which is sell everything that you have and give it to the poor, which is to say, the church in Jerusalem who are holding everything in common. And when you are praying and you're saying, give us this day our daily bread, that is because they don't have anything. Um, they are um, essentially going and begging uh, being because they have uh, renounced the world and they're living in voluntary poverty. And so this is presumably the community uh, that James is leading uh, in Jerusalem when uh, he uh, gets executed by uh, the high priest, according to Josephus. Okay. 
what we have in our earliest Christian writings about James are very, very conflicting views. And I'm going to suggest that that's because uh, there is already going to be um, serious partisanship in the early Christian texts uh, that we tend to uh, ignore because we kind of have, uh, we take, we've taken this kind of two centuries later a bishop's view looking back when it does, the, the particular fighting doesn't seem to matter anymore. The bishops won anyway. Um, so we, we read when we had the, we had a session on the Gospel of Thomas. So the Gospel of Thomas is another early saying source uh, that was lost. It's like the sayings Gospel Q. Uh, but then, at a certain point, uh, it was translated into Coptic, and also uh, it was put in part of a collection uh, of other in the Gnostic Christ, of Gnostic Christian writings. And uh, at that time, it was edited or redacted so that Gnostic sayings were also included with it, or proto-Gnostic sayings. And so we'll talk about that when we get to the Gnostics. Uh, but uh, most scholars believe that there's also an earlier tradition of Jesus' sayings that are embedded in there, uh, especially ones like this one here that I'm going to quote that has very little to do with what the Gnostics care about. The Gnostics are not particularly interested in James the Just at all, and yet, for some reason, when we, re we read this, it was very weird when we read this here, uh, there was a, a Gospel of Thomas states, in Thomas 12, uh, 2, no matter where you are, you are to go to James the Just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. <laughs> and so that's very strange. <laughs> Why would that be? Why would Jesus' brother, <laughs> you know, even if he is the main leader after Jesus died or something like that, why would, why would you say something as dramatic as uh, it was on his, for his sake, heaven and earth came into being? And so I guess what I'm suggesting here is that it is possible um, in this earliest group of the poor of Jerusalem, that they are not particularly necessarily looking just at Jesus as being their one kind of guy, but rather they may have um, at least three or four more major, at least three that we're going to mention here, major prophets that they think very highly of, um, John the Baptist, Jesus, James, uh, for which they make some fairly strong claims like that there's some kind of bigger cosmic purpose that James had here as well in the same way that Jesus did. Uh, by contrast, though, and that didn't make it in the, this, Thomas didn't make it in the <laughs> canonical Bible, right? Uh, by contrast, the Gospel of Mark, um, which is written by uh, a Greek-speaking, um, not, not native really Greek, a Syri a Aramaic um, speaking uh, person who isn't from Palestine, though. So somebody from Syria who's probably um, uh, from one of these congregations originally that Paul has planted and things like that. Um, so this gospel portrays Jesus' brothers as very antagonistic to Jesus. And when Mark creates a list of apostles, 12 apostles of Jesus, um, his brother is not on that list, right? So there's... Um, more or less uh, references in Mark's gospel where uh, essentially Jesus, uh, Jesus's brother, he, Jesus does something and his brothers all say, this guy's got to be crazy, <laughs> you know, and they, and they're, and they're his opponents. And, uh, and then, G and then at some point or other, uh, his brothers and his mother want to come and see him. And Jesus says, well, who are they? You, they're not my, they're my brother, my real brothers are my, my disciples here. And so there's some kind of an negative, uh, verses in Mark about the family of Jesus, including his mother, um, but anyway, uh, not portrayed as a central leader by Mark. Um, meanwhile, though, uh, in an earlier, um, earlier text, Paul writing himself, um, Paul is the earliest right, Christian writer that we have. He actually identifies James as the leader of the Jerusalem church, and he says that he and James have actually met. So this is a very close connection we have to understanding James as a historic figure, not only the Josephus passage where Josephus cites him as being executed, but Paul, who we have essentially a, a guy who we have his own texts, you know, has said that he went to Jerusalem and met him. And um, 
And although Paul tr always tries to put as good a face on it as possible, that the two of them came to agreements and that uh, James and he kind of struck a deal and that Paul would be able to be kind of the apostle to the Gentiles and things like that. In point of fact, um, he is actually at uh, odds with James and the Jerusalem church uh, throughout all of his writings. Uh, and so Paul uh, wouldn't really be mentioning James uh, in this very high light uh, because if he could, he would like to ignore him as existence uh, altogether, and he just isn't able to do that. Um, uh, essentially, when he first goes to, to make this compromise, um, James, as we know, as I've already mentioned here, is called James the Just because he very much believes in Mosaic law and that, that Christianity is not uh, about stopping all of uh, uh, the following all of all of the Jewish law. Uh, James is like, all the Jewish law plus, you know, so in other words, this is, it's a super Christianity, Christianity is super Judaism, not uh, kind of lackadaisical Gentile uh, Judaism. And so Paul, by contrast, more or less says that all of the people that he has converted to Christianity, all of the pagans, all the Gentiles, that they don't have to be circumcised, that they don't have to adopt the dietary restrictions, and, more problematically, though, um, that the people like Paul, who are Jewish and have been um, following uh, Jewish dietary restrictions, can now be eating with uh, those Gentile Christians, even though that wouldn't normally be allowed under Jewish law. And so he's abrogating Jewish law by doing that. And so that has made um, James is like not liking that at all. Uh, and in fact, when Paul has this meeting, he brings one of his... Um, uh, one of his Gentile disciples with him, and uh, James, as part of this deal, James insists on getting that guy circumcised. <laughs> so it is a, um, it is a, uh, Paul puts a good face on it, <laughs> but it isn't, he doesn't really coming out on top of these things. Yes, there's a question. It's more of a comment. Comment. How we were taught that who couldn't read or write? The disciples couldn't read or write. Right. Yes. And so the question is, um, where are these texts coming from? <laughs> because, can, you know, I mean, Jesus is initially, according to the stories, is going around and, and uh, calling uh, fishermen to be his disciples. These are people who would not be able to read or write. Uh, and, and we've talked about it a couple times. That Jesus also, his, his um, spoken native language would be Aramaic, which is... Uh, a Semitic Syrian language that is related to Hebrew. Uh, and so that's the common language of the, of the area, and so would all of those disciples. All of these first um, texts that we have are in Greek. So this church is already, by the time we're getting to these texts, it's already developed um, beyond the original people. And so what I would say here is when we're talking about um, the book of James, I don't have it from this slide, but the one before that, even though the book purports to be written by James the Just, most scholars don't believe that at all. So they don't believe that the brother of Jesus wrote that. In the same way, we have two letters of Peter in the New Testament that pretend to be written by Peter. They're, most scholars agree that those are not written by Peter. So these are texts that are written uh, in the name of these important leaders um, under their auspices. They're, the early Christians are trying to write them as they understood how Peter would have written. <laughs> And so for us, when I'm, t I'm quoting the letter of James, what I'm more or less saying here is, this is a Greek speaker in James's community, whether James is already dead or not by the time that they're writing this, writing uh, you know, uh, about James's authority and trying to um, emulate what James, how James would have talked. <laughs> and so for us, that's as good as we can get at what James would have said because he didn't write anything. <laughs> uh, he couldn't write, probably. Okay. Yes. No, Paul could write. <laughs> so Paul is our first writer. So Paul is uh, trained in in Greek rhetoric. Uh, he has a he is he is not an amazing writer, but he's 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 for the, these guys he's really good. <laughs> so there's a reason why um, he's uh, why things take off when he converts. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so he's one of the first ones who can. And he's our first writer that we have anyway from in Christianity. Okay. So, 
I'm going to suggest then that the earliest uh, Christianities that we have then is we have that original Jacobist church that's in Jerusalem uh, that James is the heir of from uh, James the brother of Jesus after Jesus is dead. And then we have Paul's church so that he is planting all around the Greek East that are primarily converted, converted Gentiles as opposed to being uh, Jewish people like James's church. And just to kind of show what these kind of polemic that the two of them have. <laughs> These are two quotes that are in the New Testament. So uh, we have in Paul, in, in, in Roman, the letter to the Romans, he writes, man is justified by faith and not by works. <laughs> so in other words, Paul's theology here is that for Christians, the law and all of this observance of law works is not what's important. It's faith in Christ. And the Jamesian <laughs> church, by contrast, <laughs> has written a polemic letter back, uh, and they essentially said, man is justified by works and not by faith alone. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's kind of a polemic. <laughs> so, yes, uh, Valerie. Yeah, but, um, the term, the idea of works, yeah, which, uh, it's such like that, that over, over uh, historical Christianity, that word has been used in, in many senses, and, and as you know, time went on, it developed theologically Yep. But at the time that this would have been written, was that perhaps a reference also to the very strong Judaic um, emphasis on, on law and observance and ritual? So the, yeah, the question is, we shouldn't get caught up on, uh, on the faith works debate that is like, let's say, rampaging around Protestantism, where, because uh, this became the Protestant, Luther goes back and this becomes the central thing as Luther is doing his reformation and this becomes an argument between uh, the Lutheran and Catholic churches too and so we shouldn't be reading all of this kind of modern um, controversy into it. Uh, specifically what Paul is worried about here in terms of works is uh, observance of Jewish law and so and what that is what James is worried about. <laughs> So the Jamesian church, it's not James who wrote that, but anyway, the, uh, it's, it, they are worried, they're saying, no, you have to have the law. So they are actually are not wanting to do this thing. And the, the polemic gets worse and worse to the point where at a certain point, uh, when Paul um, you know, has, is losing and losing to, to the different um, uh, apostles that are coming from James's church, at a certain point, his polemic gets to the point where he says, if you, if you go and get circumcised, then, that, then that's actually going to make it so that, uh, you know, that you've rejected Christ. <laughs> so, you know, if you actually, you know, so he actually goes, kind of takes it kind of to an extreme at a certain point when, uh, when he gets really frustrated. <laughs> So the question is, are a bunch of Christian ritual and law also p developing in parallel? And then being contrasted with faith alone. And, and being contrasted with faith alone. Um, I, I, I guess I would suggest on that is, it's hard to say because we can only know so much, but it depends on what, um, you know, as we kind of tease out the rituals that, um, let's say, James, the Jamesian church is describing in, in their corpus. So the corpus, the, the texts that we have are the letter of James, Jude, uh, the two Peters, and the, um, the book of Revelation. So those sections are kind of like from this Jam uh, Jamesian, or however I'm calling it, I'm calling it Jacobist church. Um, and then we have all of Paul's writings. And so they'll talk about different, they are talking about different rituals. So the Jamesian church is talking about the love feast, for example, which is to say, as opposed to uh, Eucharist as it later is developing, they're talking about, a, they're really probably talking about um, this thing where they've begged for their daily bread, they're sharing it all among themselves because they don't have property, and then they're having a feast of love. Not, not. We, there's a lot of words in Greek for love, <laughs> so this is not a love, erotic love feast. It is a, you know, a, a different love, <laughs> a Christian charity love kind of um, feast. And so, uh, what I would probably so maybe maybe P, maybe Paul also doesn't think too much about that particular ritual, so that might also be. Okay, so for this Jacobist church that I've been talking about then, uh, a proto-Christian movement called the Poor of Jerusalem then uh, may have uh, 
have had highly revered uh, several leaders, so I've mentioned this, right? So John the Baptist, James, uh, and then later also Jude, there's the letter of Jude, so Jude the brother of James, the brother of Jesus, <laughs> and they may have been interested in preserving their teachings, yes. Why am I saying Jacobist? Yes, I'm sorry. I should have said this. So in English, we have this totally um, whacked a way of saying, we call, you know, because we, we call the King James Bible, right? So when the English translation happens uh, in, you know, the King James Bible, the, who was king at the time? James, right? So, and so James is named James. And so all of the translators who are translating it into English they start put they they put made a lot of people named James then in the Bible in order to um, you know as a thing for the king. Uh, what the actual name of all of those guys in the Bible is is Jacob. So his name is Jacob. <laughs> so so the the he the um I, and so whatever that would be. So the original the Hebrew name that going back to the Bible the biblical name is Jacob, and then um and then they did, what the people said is well. Jake, James is just English for Jacob. <laughs> no, no, because because Jacob is a Christian word too. So, so, so the same guy. So, so James, the Apostle James the Greater, let's say in English, that's the guy who, according to the people in Spain, is buried at Santiago de Compostela because his name is Santiago. I mean, Iago is Jacob, you know, because in Latin, you know, that goes that way. So, so again, it would, so it's that same, in English, we just call it James. So James is English for Jacob, <laughs> as far as we're concerned. But anyway, in that same exact way that John here is, the, is English here for um, Johann and this or whatever it would be, Johannes, you know, Jesus again is Joshua, and then and Greek, Jesus, you know, and then, Jesus in English, and so we're, we're having to deal with the fact that the names change. But so often in English, when you have, um, you might call, um, uh, you might call the king Charles, but you then might call uh, the adjective Carolingian or Caroline, uh, and that's because that's Latin for Charles, right? <laughs> and so anyway, so Jacob in here means Jamesian, so. Yes. <laughs> you would think so, right? So the question is, I'm calling Jude the brother of James, the brother of Jesus, and shouldn't he therefore by the transitive property <laughs> be the brother of Jesus? And wouldn't you want to be saying that? And so it's weird because the letter of Jude is, is the, one of the books in the New Testament. So it is a canonized book. Um, Jude identifies himself as Jude, the brother of James. <laughs> And of course, James then identifies himself as the brother of Jesus. So, um, so I would just suggest again that the reason why Jude is doing that is because James is a more important figure in the Jamesian church. And so it's a big enough deal that to be the brother of James that Jude, maybe, who, maybe Jude is essentially saying here that Jude is the leader of the community after James has died. But yes, he's one of, he's the brother of Jesus as well. So, Okay. Uh, and so anyway, so they may all be interested in all of these kind of leaders. So James, Jude, Jesus, John the Baptist. This group continues to uh, be Jewish, insisting that their distinct teachings don't replace Mosaic law, but are added in addition to the law. So we've mentioned that a couple times. The group practices asceticism. They're mendicants, so they live by begging. They hold property in common. They give all to the poor. And they're very poor themselves. And in the letters that we have of their, from their church, they are the people who are especially saying, woe unto you rich. <laughs> and so they are constantly kind of calling, uh, you know, uh, curses down upon the rich. And you can read into some of what they're saying uh, that what they're, some of the rich that they're talking about are the people in these rich Greek churches that Paul has planted. Uh, and there's other places where some of their coded language, they may be specifically citing Paul um, as, uh, as somebody who's not, not of the true fold. Um, Paul also maybe doesn't, uh, there are coded phrases where he uh, finds representatives of their church to also not be uh, true apostles. So there's a different points in Paul where he's sarcastically talking about people he calls super apostles. So he plants Christian churches in Syria, Asia Minor, which is to say Turkey now, 
and Greece. Um, what ends up happening after Paul makes his congregations, then the Jamesian church or the Jacobin church um, sends apostles, including Peter, to these groups to teach them James's view of the law. And James's view, according to, again, to the epistle of James here is, if a man breaks just one commandment and keeps all the others, he is guilty of breaking them all. <laughs> so you have to keep all the commandments, right? Um, Paul sarcastically calls his opponents super apostles in the letter, one of the letters to the Corinthians. But because of their success, at a certain point, one of Paul's uh, followers who wrote the letter of Timothy in his name says, everyone in the province of Asia deserted me. So even though he is planted, he initially is in Antioch. He has to abandon Antioch because uh, the, the, the super apostles kind of take that over and, and are in charge. He plants these churches in Anatolia, Asia Minor, in Turkey. And he essentially says that he had to abandon those as well. And by the end of his career, um, Paul is writing his last letter. He writes to the Roman church because he's more or less said, uh, I have n there's nothing more I can do in the East. Because, it's the, because these super apostles have kind of come in and they have perverted all of my work, I therefore am appealing to you, the Roman church, the Christians that are in Rome, to fund me to have a new mission to Spain where I'm going to start all over again. And so that's where Paul is by the end of his um, career. Um, we don't have time to go through this in detail, uh, but essentially this is a kind of a timeline where we're talking about... Um, uh, Paul, who is very early involved in this, and then what's happening in Jerusalem with James, the brother of Jesus, at the same time. Um, so from the crucifixion of Jesus in 30, James is taking over. He's in charge of the fo followers in Jerusalem, the poor. Paul converts. He develops his ideas. He converts these people in, in Syria, Antioch. Uh, he has this initial uh, agreement with James but ultimately abandons Antioch for Turkey. Um, he writes these letters. Uh, Jewish con Christians continue to pressure Paul about the Mosaic law. Uh, Paul continues to do this kind of thing. And then, like I say, at the end, he's feeling defeated. He writes to the Romans, as I mentioned here in 56. Meanwhile, he's trying one last time to make a deal with James. And so he has gone around all of his congregations and taken up a collection for the poor, for the poor of Jerusalem, which is to say, uh, he's going to bring all this money to them so that they can, he can give to the poor and they can not be as poor as they are <laughs> as a group. Uh, and then when he goes there, though, what ends up happening is he goes to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, one of the uh, Christians there denounces him as a, fo a, false, um, a false Jew when he's on the Temple Mount. So he has, uh, as a person who has broken law, he's not allowed to enter into some of the precincts. And so from being there, he gets arrested. He says he's a Roman citizen, so he appeals to Rome so that he can go have his case tried there uh, and eventually goes to Rome and he's executed there. And then James, meanwhile, uh, gets executed on a completely different reason, as we saw in Josephus uh, in Jerusalem. So anyway, at this point, Paul probably is feeling like he lost, <laughs> you know, uh, when he died. Uh, turns out he didn't, though. In the meantime, it's, it's helpful when you write letters. <laughs> so, so he's one of the earliest writers, and that ended up being very important. Okay, so immediately then, though, after these deaths, there is a decline of this Jacobin or Jamesian influence. So from that height of influence, uh, the church in Jerusalem quickly declines. So one of the big problems was the total destruction of Jerusalem. <laughs> so the church can't be the church of Jerusalem anymore after AD 70 when the Romans destroy the city and kick all of Jews and Christians out. Uh, it's possible that the Christians fled before that to a city in the Perea called Pella. Um, Paul's letters, meanwhile, become authoritative among many early Christians. So many of his early churches uh, save them. They keep reading them. Uh, they start to think of them. They use them as worship to in, in their worship services, and they consider them authoritative for their instruction. And uh, there continue to be, um, although there continue to be Jewish Christians who practice the law, uh, there continue to be more and more converts who are Gentiles who don't feel the need to practice uh, the law. So ultimately, Paul's uh, viewpoint wins on that. So what happens to these Jewish Christians? Um, so this is one of these ways where we're, we're starting out with these different groups that are not among the Proto-Orthodox. So the Proto-Orthodox leaders, um, as time goes on, regard Judaizing Christians now as heretics. So once uh, the, for the Proto-Orthodox, 
these Gentile Christians who don't believe that they need to be um, under the law or the Jewish law, um, for all of the Christians who are insisting on that, that's now become a heresy, right? So one of the groups that they identify are called Ebionites, and the name of the Ebionites may derive from the Hebrew for poor, so Ebionim, so it may be why that's why they're called that, and as we saw, James's church called themselves the poor, right? So it may be that. Um, another group that the Proto-Orthodox call are called Nazarenes, and that also may be from this of Nazareth, so that's where that's probably coming from. Um, far from being a heretical offshoot, though, the way the Proto-Orthodox saw them of Christianity, it's quite possible that the Ebionites represent a remnant of the religion's earliest form, right? So I argue that that's maybe what it is here. So what are the Ebionites like in the second century? So they continue to insist that everybody needs to practice uh, most of Jewish law to be true Christians. Um, Proto-Orthodox Christians say they're ascetics who regard John the Baptist and Jesus as vegetarians. So they're also vegetarians uh, in their practice. Uh, Ebionites also emphasize the oneness of God. And so that's something that's very true to uh, other Jews. And therefore the humanity of Jesus and so they reject all of the kind of proto-Orthodox ideas that are emerging about Jesus' divinity. And so they don't see Jesus as born of a virgin and all of the other kind of things that are emerging in the, in the, uh, the proto-Orthodox understanding of Christ. For the Ebionites then, Jesus is a major prophet. Uh, he was resurrected, uh, but it's not because he is God. Uh, he's a major prophet alongside John the Baptist and James uh, the Just. The Gebeonites have their own scripture. So, uh, as we mentioned, they obviously reject Paul's letters. None of that is scripture as far as they're concerned. Paul is not a, an apostle for them. Instead, they have their own gospel that is <coughs> possibly, we don't know if this is all one gospel, because we don't have it. These books are all lost. So it's either the gospel of the Hebrews, the gospel of the Nazarenes, the gospel of the Ebionites. There may be three separate texts, or there may be three different versions of one text, or there just might be one text that is lost that the different people called by different names. Um, uh, although this uh, gospel was used by the Ebionites in Aramaic still, so this is their language, apparently it's from a Greek original, because from the different fragments that we have, um, the sense of it is, is that there was an original text that was written in Greek uh, that was then translated into Aramaic, and that became the um, Ebionite gospel. Um, but from what we have from the seg the 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 different clips that we have. Just we have little parts where essentially the proto-Orthodox people are quoting it to show how these guys are heretics. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have the text itself. Um, in doing that, it does seem like it's a completely independent um, gospel tradition and is not simply an edited version of one of the gospels that we have in the canon. So it's sad that it's lost. So I just wanted to show you guys a little bit of this one. Uh, here's some quotations from the Gospel of Hebrews that we have. So this is quoted by uh, St. Jerome, and when it happened, I'm sorry, and it happened that when the Lord came up out of the water of baptism, so this is that important episode when Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, the whole fountain of the Holy Spirit came down on him and rested on him. It said to him, my son, I was waiting for you in all the prophets, waiting for you to come so I could rest in you, for you are my rest, you are my first begotten son who rules forever. So here um, Jesus is being called a prophet and also uh, it's the Holy Spirit who is the, uh, the father here, or the actually the parent. <laughs> it's actually the mother of Jesus in this case. Uh, and because we also have Origen quoting, <laughs> uh, quoting this portion of it, uh, and Jerome also quotes this. And Jesus said, just now my mother the Holy Spirit took me by one of my hairs and brought me to, to Tibor, the great mountain. So essentially, this theology that the Ebionites have, uh, the Holy Spirit is a female divine being, but not, not God and not part of a trinity or something like that, uh, is a female divine being. And Jesus is a, a important, powerful prophet who is the um, uh, child of the Holy Spirit in this. Thanks. 
extended. Yes. Yeah, so the comment is, is that the um, Holy Spirit, specifically probably because of the, the word uh, in Hebrew is feminine, um, is then often when you have uh, gendered language, uh, and so is viewed as a feminine divine, and that's where part of this theology is probably coming from, Valerie. Yeah, so the, the comment here is that uh, in the traditional, in the Orthodox Christian uh, trinity, where there's a father, son, and like you say, spirit, dove, whatever, um, we're missing the divine feminine. <laughs> and so it may, would make very reasonable sense to have a heavenly mother be part of that uh, tr uh, triad or trinity. Uh, in this case, the Ebionites, anyway, are ha showing, anyway, their conception of the spirit is, is part of the divine feminine. Okay, so just to conclude, what happened to the Ebionites then? <laughs> so, um, of course, uh, the Orthodox Church ultimately becomes the state religion of the Roman Empire, and they have labeled the, this Judaizing Christianity, Ebionites and the Nazarenes and the other Jewish Christians, as a heresy. Uh, it apparently dies out in the Roman Empire um, as of the 5th century. However, the sect um, also may have moved over the border and out, and specifically south, so this is the... East Roman Empire, and so then this is into the Arabian Peninsula, the Hejaz. Um, it may have survived now another five centuries down there or more, um, because Muslim and Jewish historians record the presence of a Jewish sect in the Hejaz and in Yemen that regarded Jesus as a prophet here as late as the 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries. Um, and it's possible <laughs> that the Ebionite um, conception of Christianity may have influenced Islam. So that it's possible that these are the Christians that Muslims are talking about, and certainly um, Islam regards Jesus as a prophet, but not as part of a trinity or God. And so, uh, do you have a comment, Shaheen? Yeah, um, but did, uh, Muslims do believe, or the Quran has a very strong teaching that Jesus was a virgin birth. Okay. Okay. Um, and also that although the Ebionites may have influenced this view of Jesus, they were there were other Christians because this idea of Jesus being divine is st strongly condemned. Okay. So the comment is that... Um, I think we were able to capture the comment. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for the comment. <laughs> I'm trying to do this because we can't share because of the wind microphone, so I appreciate it. Okay. So... <laughs> This is a little different from that original mainstream or the Episcopal view that I was kind of showing before, the way the bishops were looking at it. So now maybe I'm, su I'm suggesting here that maybe we have this initial poor followers of John and Jesus that becomes in Jerusalem the Jamesian church, Jacobus church, and that ultimately becomes the Ebionites who go extinct. Uh, meanwhile, Paul has gotten in the act and there's a Paulist church. The Paulist church is massively influenced by James and Peter and all the other people that are coming from that, so it's not just all Paul or something like that, but that that foundation, especially among the Greek-speaking Gentiles, uh, is the direction that becomes the proto-Orthodox uh, and the one, anyway, ultimately the state religion of the Roman Empire, the Orthodox and Catholic Church. Um, the question, though, in that timeline, then, is, is as, as that gets going after Paul's gone, is how far are we going to go in this Paul direction? <laughs> so we, we kind of all agree that um, uh, we don't want to get circumcised, <laughs> you know, and, and that we um, don't want to have these particular dietary restrictions. Um, but we, what, what else do we maybe don't want to do? Uh, how much of it are we going to uh, are we going to leave behind? So we've seen some of the answers when we were talking a little bit. We had the preview for of the Marcionites and the Gnostics, right? So um, talk a little bit here about the Marcians. Uh, Marcionism. So in the middle of the second century, a guy named Marcion of Sinope, he pretty much argued, as I mentioned, for a very big purge. <laughs> so he um, likes what Paul has to say. He doesn't like the precursors um, of the religion. So here he is. Um, Marcion, actually, it's an interesting um, elimination of him because it's defaced, right? So 
Uh, there's a picture of Marcy, and at a certain point, somebody scribbled him out because he's a her heretic, right? Uh, but that's how we get to keep the texts. <laughs> so Marcion um, pretty much wants to take Christianity kind of all Paul. So he is not, he is not um, interested in the precursors that I mentioned. And he's the guy who um, essentially has the very first official canon uh, Christianity, although it's one that Christians other than Marcionites view as heretical. He in injects the idea into it. Uh, and so for, as I mentioned, this is restricted uh, scripture to 10 of Paul's letters and just portions of the Gospel of Luke. Um, and in fact, the fact that he did that and kind of injected that idea in the same way that um, almost everything in history is action and reaction, the Proto-Orthodox react to that, and so they create their more lar their larger canon that still restricts the canon, but uh, is bigger than Marcion's as a result of that. So Marcion further rejected the Old Testament and taught that the God of the Hebrew Bible was different, as I mentioned, an evil entity and very different from the benevolent God of the New Testament. And so he also then, uh, when he, tr he tried to, he was hoping to become Bishop of Rome. <laughs> he was trying to become the leader of the church there, but when they kicked him out, uh, he went back to Anatolia and uh, where, his, where he's from, so Sinope is in Turkey, and, um, and created, he's very, uh, great speaker and uh, also wealthy, and he's able to create a kind of a rival church structure that lasts for several centuries in Anatolia. So, uh, so there's Marcionism, <laughs> and then we're gonna bring in also Gnosticism. So a contemporary of Marcion, uh, Valentinus, who was at right around that same time, the early second century, uh, they take this dualism that Marcion has and takes it farther by deciding we need to have more explanation of how this all works. We have purged the texts down. Now let's write some new texts in order to understand um, this religion that we're having, this kind of uh, what's going to be called essentially Gnostic Christianity. So Gnosticism, what's Gnosticism? The word Gnosis, Greek, means knowledge. So the word uh, has been applied to a whole bunch of different individuals uh, from pre- and non-Christian Israelite Gnostics to medieval European groups like the Bogomils and the Cathars. And so we had lectures on, on the Cathars and anyway on, on Gnostics. Um, there's these ideas that have been floating around and you were mentioning also, uh, Jane was mentioning about how dualism has also been floating around. So this is not all made up by Valentinus or these Christians. They are taking ideas, uh, Platonism, pre-existing Gnosticism, and now they are fusing these together into this kind of super Pauline um, kind of Christianity. So while they share some ideas and they influence each other, they're not all one single continuous group. I mentioned that one of the things that's happening is that they're not creating a rival church structure. They're embedded inside your church and you just don't know it. So it's this, they have a little secret club. And so it's very hard for the bishops to, to root them out like bishops like to do <laughs> with heretics, as far as the, from the bishop perspective, anyway. Um, the main uh, enduring historic Gnostic religion are the Mendeans in northern Iraq. Um, uh, and now there are neo-Gnostic groups that are in the West that don't have continuity. But anyway, people have read Gnostic texts and have started becoming Gnostics again. Okay, so some of this Gnostic knowledge. So this is secret, but this is kind of what the Gnostics... Um, there's what this is kind of what they're, I'll tell you their secrets. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, in some, this is what some, the, some of their secrets are. The material world is created by this flawed creator, the Demiurge. Uh, and so this is the same as um, Aristotle's material cause, the Demiurge. You know, that's the creator God, but he's flawed and has created a, a flawed simulacrum of the ideal reality. So essentially Plato's forms, there's the ideal spiritual world of the ideas, and now there's matter, which has been created by a mistake of this bad, flawed God, the Demiurge. The true God is the source of, of uh, the true ideal universe of light. So a spiritual God um, is the source of the, re the real creation, the I ideas, uh, the forms. How did this cosmic accident happen? It's understood by learning highly complex mythological cosmological drama about different aeons. This is different divine beings that are emanating from the true God. So in the same way that we have that, uh, the Aristotelian or, or Platonic idea of there's the, the unmoved mover that is everything is emanating from, uh, this is taken up with the Gnostics and now different divine beings are in a sequence coming forth. Uh, the last of the 
what does it say here? Yeah, anyway, so one of the way the, these eons that are coming out um, are, are things like the last of these eons is wisdom, uh, which is, again, a female divinity, so Sophia um, is a, one of the eons. So hum, some humans contain a divine spark of light that can be returned to the divine realm through the process of enlightened awakening. So you may be one of the, the people who are actually not just material robots or whatever that are walking around soulless. You may actually have the divine spark inside you. And the way we can find out is if I induct you into my secret group and you learn the, <laughs> the gnosis and, and it enlightens you, right? And so that's how the Gnostics can be in their own kind of little uh, group within the church. Um, and so Jesus, according to the Gnostics, as they understand it, is the son of the true God who sent into the material world in order to bring about this salvation through enlightenment. So Jesus is not actually material, is not human, just had the appearance of being human, uh, and is sent to you know, essentially show us the way back to the, the real world of the ideas, of the forms of the spirits. Valerie. Well, that, so I, I, so I guess I'm not saying that they're, so they're, the other ones are particularly Gnostic. So the, if you, I don't know if we can hear that question. Am I repeating them still? <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, so essentially Zoroastrianism predates all of this stuff, and as we kind of said at the beginning um, when Jane was talking. So with the Zoroastrians, in some ways, they um, have influenced all of these kinds of Christianities, and they, um, their ideas are there first, and uh, the Zoroastrians continue to this day, um, and so they are, they're still there too. But, the, but in particularly, having come through Gnosticism, uh, this Gnostic path, possibly the Mandaeans are influenced by Eastern Gnostics and are a remnant of some of that directly, as opposed to the separate column of the Zoroastrians. Okay, uh, we're can't, not going to go through too much detail of, of Gnosticism, but I'm just going to mention some of this because the Gnostics, the whole idea is that it has to be cryptic and it has to be a bunch of stuff that's hard to understand because um, otherwise if everybody would know it, it would be like the plebes all know it. And the point of it is, is that uh, only the secret group can know this secret knowledge, right? And so, um, so one of the things is, so there's all these kind of different terms. So there's the monad is the one absolute God, the perfect aeon who rules from the pleroma, which is the fullness, this region of light, the region of the forms. There are these aeons that emanate from the moad, monad, and these are the universals, the forms. There are things like thought and silence. Uh, Sophia, I mentioned, is one of these aeons, the last aeon specifically. And then Sophia, who tries to create on her own, um, as opposed to the way they're all other ones are doing it with the, the, the monad. Uh, then accidentally creates the bad god. So this is the kind of bad moment in history. And it's ironic that wisdom is what causes the error. <laughs> and that creates the Demiurge, who is the flawed god of the Old Testament. And the Demiurge just creates, there's the creation story like in Genesis, but it's to create the bad world, <laughs> the physical world. Uh, then there are archons, who are the evil angels that serve the Demiurge. And finally, Gnosis, we mentioned. This is that knowledge that as we're sharing it like right now, or as we would have shared it actually through the ritual telling of all the Gnostic scriptures, as you're learning those and studying those, those are freeing your particle of light that's trapped in you so that at some point or other through that and also ascetic practices as we, as we eschew the flesh, as we uh, cease to you know, have sex, as we don't be gluttonous or all those kind of things, as we completely reject the physical, uh, that's how we're going to achieve this kind of spiritual enlightenment, which is uh, part of the Gnosis. So uh, the most important uh, text that comes out of, so in the Nakamadi Library is a whole bunch of collection of Gnostic texts, unlike with the Marcionites and the Ebionites, whose texts are lost, and all we have are what the Proto-Orthodox people uh, said nasty things about <laughs> them and excerpted them and things like that, as we saw. For the Gnostics, we had that, Two, but then in the middle of the 20th century, we found an entire collection buried in Egypt of Gnostic text. And included in that um, is the Gospel of Thomas that I mentioned, 
And so that's an a early, probably early sayings gospel that has stuff that goes all the way back to the Jamesian church, um, but is now f- come to us in a Coptic translation that includes Gnostic editions or proto-Gnostic editions. And so I'm going to take some of those excerpts, the Gnostic ones, and read you so that you can kind of just get a flavor for Gnosticism here. So at the beginning of the gospel, oh, and we mentioned here that Thomas as the Gospel of Thomas. Thomas then is in, by the time it gets to the Gnostics, the Gnostics don't care about James and they don't care about Peter. Uh, they care about uh, apostles like Mary Magdalene and they care about um, Thomas. And Thomas for them is Jesus' twin brother as opposed to James who is Jesus' real brother. <laughs> this is a, a later kind of mythological brother. Thomas is um, uh, Aramaic the word Thomas is Aramaic for twin. So Thomas does mean twin. And he's called sometimes Didymus Thomas, which is Greek for twin. So Didymus Thomas the twin. Twin, twin, twin is the guy's name, right? <laughs> so it's like uh, a divine pairing, like Castor and Pollux. So there's like a divine one, Jesus, and then there's Thomas, right? So whichever ca- Castor is the god and Pollux is the mortal, Hercules is the god and Iphicles is the mortal. So you always will you'll have a lot of those kind of things. And we have this same kind of a thing for uh, Jesus and Thomas, uh, this, as we're getting to here. Okay. So here it goes. These are the secret sayings. So again, it's already Gnostic in the title here. Secret sayings that the living Jesus spoke to Didymus, Judas, Thomas. Okay, so this is Jude is the guy's name, according to this text. And his name is Tom, 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 Judas the twin. And uh, he said... Whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. So this is the, the central Gnostic idea, which is wisdom, as you're learning the Gnosis, that's what's giving you true life. This physical death and everything like that has, is totally meaningless because what's real is the ideas, right? And so Jesus said, those who seek should not stop seeking until they find. So I put that in red because that is like what's in the rest of the Jesus tradition, right? So we have that I mentioned as um, that's common to uh, almost every Jesus collection. But then we have this addition. When they find, they will be disturbed. When they are disturbed, they will marvel and they will reign over all. (laughs) So this is not normal Orthodox Christian stuff here. So the idea is here: you're, uh, you know, ask and you'll be, you'll receive; knock and you'll, it'll be opened. Those are the, those are the passages in Orthodox Christianity. Now, when you find, when you find the knowledge, when you find the gnosis, it's going to freak you out, because <laughs> this is weird stuff about the demiurge and the and Sophia and all these kind of things, the pl- plurima and the aeons. But when you're disturbed, you're going to marvel that this is the truth of the universe that the Gnostics have. And when you have that, you're going to reign over everybody because you are the people who really understand how the universe is working instead of all the people in the rat race who believe that um, that kind of game, the, that the physical world is what's re- where it's at. Okay, same thing here. Jesus says, if your leaders say to you, look, Father's imperial rule in the sky, then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say it's in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, uh, Father's imperial rule is within you and outside you. So this, this is a translation. It also means the kingdom of God. So Jesus talks about the kingdom of God or Father's imperial rule, the Roman Empire of heaven. Um, and so this part here is, again, this is, this is also in Q. It's, it's in Luke, right? Uh, this essentially um, idea of it. But then we have the Gnostic interpretation. When you know yourselves, then you will be known. And when you understand that you are children of the living Father, and when you understand that, you are children of the living Father. But if you do not know yourselves, then you live in poverty, and you are the poverty. (laughs) So, again, the living Father is this God of light, and when you are knowing your true self here, then you're going to be children of that living Father. But otherwise, you're living in poverty. And this is not... Um, the way that the Jamesians, for example, considered themselves to be the poor, right? This is intellectual poverty. Uh, Jesus said to his disciples, compare me to something and tell me what I'm like. So that happens a bunch in Mark. He asks, who do you say that I am? He asks Peter and the other disciples. So in Thomas, he says, Simon Peter said to him, you are like a just angel. Matthew said to him, you are like a wise philosopher. 
uh, Thomas. So you know where this is going to be the good one, right? Because we know that these guys, according to the Gnostics, Peter, you know, he represents the Orthodox guys. So he obviously doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Matthew, same way thing. Thomas says, teacher, my mouth is utterly unable to say what you are like. He continues, Jesus says, I'm not your teacher. Because you have drunk, you've become intoxicated by the, from, from the bubbling spring that I have tended. So it's not me teaching you. You are finding all of this information uh, of the gnosis that's coming into you. And he, Jesus, took Thomas and withdrew, and he spoke three sayings to him. And when Thomas came back to his friends, they asked him, what did Jesus say to you? And Thomas said to them, if I tell you one of the sayings he spoke to me, you will pick up rocks and stone me, and fire will come from the rocks and devour you. <laughs> so in other words, there is some secret stuff, <laughs> you know, in the Gnosis. Um, and Jesus told that secret stuff to Thomas. And if I were to tell you that, you would freak out and you'd kill me. And then from killing me, because it would be so wrong for you to kill me when, I tell, when I'm speaking this kind of truth, the rocks that you use to kill me would then burn and blow you up, you know? <laughs> so, it's a, so this is um, strong Gnostic stuff, right? Okay, the last one of these, I think. Jesus says, if uh, the flesh came into being because of the spirit, that is a marvel. But if spirit came into being because of the body, that is a marvel of marvels. Yet I marvel at how this great wealth has come to dwell in this poverty. So this is a Gnostic argument um, that, um, so how, what comes, which came first, your spirit or, or the physical flesh, right? So it's, it would be a marvel if mat, the material world here derives from you know, something as wonderful as the spirit. But it would be insane to imagine that the physical world existed first and spirit developed out of something so wretched and awful. And yet, the marvel for the Gnostics is that the spirit, the ideas, all the stuff that this divine spark, the light, uh, that that is in this horrible, impoverished prison of the material world, you know, again, is a marvel. So you can kind of just see how the, how the Gnostic sensibilities work here. Oh, it does one more. <laughs> whoever has come to know the world has discovered a carcass, <laughs> and who has ever discovered a carcass, of that person the world is not worthy. So the world is a dead husk. <laughs> and once you realize that, the, you're, the world does, you're better than the world. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole thing because I, I put a whole bunch of quotes here, but essentially there's another, here's just an, there's a lot of Gnostic library that we have. We had a, a whole lecture on Gnostic texts before. Uh, one of them here that I just am excerpting just slightly here is the Apocryphon of John. And I only mention it because um, uh, this is how technical, so the other, the Thomas sayings are really, you know, getting you to kind of just get a sense of all this Gnosticism and there's a secret behind the sayings that is easy to kind of figure out. But I, I want to point out that there is like then just this incredible detail of how the theology and cosmology works for the Gnostics. And so I, John, asked to know it, and he, Jesus, said to me, the monad, which is to say God, right, is a monarchy with nothing above it. It is he who exists as God and Father of everything, the invisible one who is above everything, who exists as incorruption, who is the pure light into which no eye can look. He is the invisible spirit of whom it is not right to think of him as a God or something similar, for he is more than a God. For he does not exist in something inferior to him, since everything exists in him. For it is he who establishes himself. He is eternal, since he does not need anything. For he is total perfection. That's not too far off from actual, you know, in other words, God is all, all powerful, right? But the monads, so then it goes on. The monads thought performed a deed, and she came forth from his mind. She is the forethought of all. Her light shines like his light the perfect power, which is in the image of the invisible virginal spirit who is perfect, the first power, the glory of Barbello, the perfect glory in the aeons. So in other words, God then goes through this incredible um, cosmology and myth of all of the different uh, aeons that God's mind is producing in this creation of the spiritual or, or ideal realm. So there's a whole pentad of paired aeons, forethought, thought, indestructibility, eternal life, truth, then uh, the word of creation, who is Christ, according to the, this particular Gnostics, uh, the autogenes, and they all come forth. 
And then finally, Sophia of the Epinoia, being an aeon, conceived a thought from herself. She wanted to bring forth a likeness out of herself without the consent of the spirit he had not approved and without her consent. So in other words, Sophia is the last then to come forth and she does this creation that I mentioned and the result is a powerful but flawed God which she names Yaltabaoth, which is the Yahweh or Jehovah of the Old Testament, the Bible. Yaltabaoth goes on to enact Genesis and then special roles are given to Adam and Eve, Seth, Noah's wife, Nerea. It ends with the Savior explaining this whole um, his role to John. So that's how this text goes. And there's lots and lots and lots of texts like this that are, um, I've summarized it here to make it easy, but <laughs> it goes on for pages and pages with all these technical names of all these aeons and what they all did and everything like that. So, um, much more complicated picture is how I would just will end this <laughs> than what we started from where we kind of uh, initially just from the bishop's perspective uh, saw the whole thing as leading to bishops, <laughs> you know, so Jesus to apostles to bishops and now bishops should be in charge. Uh, instead, um, there's a complex uh, origin to the earliest Christianities. Um, the creation of the proto-Orthodox group is the interplay between I think the Jamesian church and the Pauline church. Um, uh, Paul doesn't think he's going to have won that, <laughs> uh, but ultimately uh, it's the Paulist church that ends up spreading uh, and, and taking on, you know, moving forward, and Paul's texts. Uh, there is still lots of influence that happens, so it's not just all Paul, because um, people who wanted to go all Paul, <laughs> uh, like Marcion, also uh, got um, labeled as heretics. Uh, including then the ones beyond them, the the um, Gnostics. Yes, I'm sorry. So the question is, where do the Manichees fit into this? And so um, we had a whole uh, lecture on Manichees. So Manichaeism is, in a way, its own um, religion. So when Manny, uh, uh, who is a Middle Eastern um, prophet, he is bringing together multiple existing religious traditions. And so it's based on, uh, it's dualist again. So it's like the Gnostics. So he has been influenced by Christian Gnosticism, uh, but he's also influenced by Zoroastrianism too. And so then he creates um, kind of his own dualistic religion and that is living side by side, uh, for example, with Marcionism. So uh, I think it's as late as the, uh, 10th or 11th century Muslim um, scholars, again, historians, are mentioning that um, both Manichees and the Marcionites are in uh, uh, Central Asia anyway, you know, so the area of what's now kind of like uh, Uzbekistan and all that kind of area. Uh, and so, so they're kind of side by side. And so then the Manichees also um, are a competing religion before um, uh, before the triumph and a little bit after the triumph of Christianity in the Roman Empire. And so the Manichees um, kind of famously convert uh, St. Augustine. And so because Saint, before he becomes Christian. So St. Augustine is pagan first, or he's half, half Christian, his mom's a Christian, uh, but he never takes it seriously. He becomes a Manichee, but then he meets a, Mani, a Manichean leader and he finds the guy to be intellectually dumb. And he's like, that's the best you guys got. And so then he, he doesn't think that man, much of Manichaeism after that. And so then he meets um, uh, St. Ambrose, the a very brilliant bishop of uh, Milan. He had always thought that Christianity was kind of dumb because he'd read the Bible and he thought this is, he'd read it literally and he thought that there's no way that this is anything. Uh, and so the, then Ambrose is like, no, you have to um, interpret this all symbolically. And so then Augustine is like, whoa, this is great. And so anyway, so then, so then Augustine, though, because he's influenced by Manichaeism, he brings some of these dualist ideas into the West because Augustine um, really affects everything after him. So, Okay, yeah, urgent. Yes. John, I think maybe, uh, I'm not sure if I can hear myself. Yes. Yes, <laughs> right, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, do you want to try this for the Q&A so that we can pass the microphone? Okay, so that, yes, that'll, that'll, be, that'll easier. be good. Okay. Who's going to ask the question? Your word. You can ask your question. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get to pass the mic. <laughs> you earned the right. 
Aryan, Aryanism. Is it close to Ebonia, Ebonites, or he also was maybe during that time? Yeah. So the question is about Arianism. And so this is, that would be the next, um, the next phase of Christological controversy. <laughs> So I'm take these are the, this is like the earliest grouping, which is to say the Ebionites and the and the Marcians and the Gnostics. Then the next uh, phase of fighting among the among the um, Proto-Orthodox are going to be people debating about uh, Christological controversy, and so uh, specifically, like you say, Arian, uh, who is around at the time of the Council of Nicaea, so he's already into the fourth century, and he's condemned there. But it's essentially people are trying to, at that point, reconcile. They've kind of gone down this, this pink path here already. So Arian is already going down that path. Uh, but then they're, they haven't made the final decisions about how they understand Christ to be God. Right? And so Arian is going to emphasize more, uh, which is it? Arian is the, <laughs> emphasizing more Christ's humanity. Christ. He does not proceed from the Father in eternity. He is created. He's created. Okay. So yeah. So it's 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 Christ. Uh, so it's again emphasizing the more that God God the Creator as the as the one, and then since Christ is divine, but Christ is a creation, it's not a Trinity, right? And so that view, so Arian's view, to is the Ebonites. yeah, it's closer to the Ebionites uh, in that way, but not necessarily whether it's influenced. I don't know. Direct influence. Uh, John, yeah. Thank you, John, for sharing the knowledge. Um, it, it's, it's interesting, a couple things strike me. First of all, how so many things uh, in life seem to be borrowed, and, and also the role of technology or some new thing. You talk maybe the fact that Paul has letters that uh, kind of yeah. exist beyond his own life might be part of the reason why his particular track survives and has influence beyond what seems maybe not a lot of successes. He has successes, but is taken back right. in this tension. Um, and also the role of how ideas are born, this whole Zoroastrianism, plays a bit of a role, at least in giving a template of ideas that seem to be borrowed. One of the things I'm not so familiar with and maybe is, is dealing with this tension between the Jamesian and Paulian Pauline church is the amalgamation or the fact that the, Paul, the Pauline or at least the amalgamation of that becomes systematized, becomes maybe the Catholic Orthodox. But I'm not that well versed with the church, and it could be a lack of my knowledge, of dealing with that, rec reconciling it. And it seems to be homogenized because there's some antagonism. There, there's differences. Yes. And, and from my kind of Catholic upbringing, though I struggle on that, I'm not always so aware of that, uh, those really tough issues going on. Can, how did the church, uh, let's say, harmonize all that? Right. So even though I've, I've kind of picked out, I've picked out kind of different verses where we can kind of see those tensions, and um, Paul is trying throughout all of his writing to be very diplomatic about it. <laughs> And so he, he is, um, you have to kind of read into what he's actually doing and, uh, and the different frustrations when you can to, to kind of say, he isn't actually saying, when he talks about the super apostles, I'm in, in a way inferring that that's who he's referring to because these are people, he's saying that people who have credentials, the, the, tr the church is asking him, um, there are these super apostles who are having, um, who have credentials that say that they are apostles, right? And where are they getting them from? They're getting from Jerusalem. And they're, and they're asking Paul, why don't you have credentials like that? And he says, why do I need credentials? I created this church, right? You know, something like that. You know me, we, were, we, we felt the spirit together, that kind of thing. But you have to kind of read into what he's saying in order to understand kind of like that, that backdrop. Because he's, not try, he's, not, um, he's trying not to appear that he is in opposition to, to James. He would like to um, have, it, have struck a deal with him. He's very angry when, um, when he feels like he's got to struck a deal that he feels like Peter's gone back on it. Uh, and then how is the smoothing out work? So one of the um, things that we have besides, besides Paul is, um, uh, as the early letters, we have Acts. And so by the time Luke is writing, uh, Luke is coming from one of these Pauline churches, but um, it's, Luke is not um, necessarily 
just a blind disciple of Paul. So Luke has already uh, tried to harmonize between, between the two, and Luke, uh, it, although Paul is a very important figure in Acts, uh, Luke already has a little bit more nuanced view of Paul, but also is also trying to show a positive story of how this has all kind of come together. So Luke is already writing long after the church in Jerusalem doesn't exist anymore. Jerusalem's already been destroyed. And so they're already kind of smoothing it out even in the sources as we have them. Uh, and so that's why, and so then that's the path. And so, uh, and then what other things that, that happen are, if anything was too negative and not coded, it probably didn't get put, kept in the canon. So there are other letters that Paul wrote, even early letters that are, are lost. Uh, and certainly we don't have um, maybe the earliest or the whole corpus of what the, the uh, Jamesian church wrote, we only have a handful of those that made it into the canon that are only obliquely, um, you know, the, James, the letter of James does seem to be um, writing a condemnation of Paul's theology when James is saying things like faith without work, you know, you have to have works <laughs> and all this kind of thing. Uh, but uh, it's not, they're, they're, any, any talking they have that may be against Paul, uh, it will be coded. So they're talking about um, Balaam. You know, like, don't follow after Balaam. <laughs> wow. I, Leandro. <laughs> don't follow after Balaam. <laughs> and so maybe they're meaning Paul there because um, the idea is that he's bald. <laughs> And, and anyway, so there, so there, so and so therefore you can you cannot see that because the church doesn't at the end there's no they don't have a dog in it anymore. Both those guys are all dead, you know. So now now the church are just heirs to all of this, right? Yeah, Valerie. Yeah. Um, is this on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, uh, just about the time when Gnosticism was being, I guess, suppressed or rejected. Um, on the other hand, uh, there, there arose a very great influence from Neoplatonism, which it seems to me has some quite similar ideas about, you know, emanations and, you know, layers of reality and whatnot. And, uh, and, and was not Augustine, I think, influenced by Neoplatonism quite a bit? Yeah. So it's curious that Gnosticism with some very similar ideas and tropes was quite utterly rejected and seen as a heresy, and yet Neoplatonism, though similar, was very much accepted and incorporated. And I'm just wondering, were there like political reasons why one and not the other? And you know, what about that? Um, so the idea here is that uh, you know, anyway, that Neoplatonism isn't um, absorbed uh, like directly, where they decide, like for example, that Porphyry or some uh, Neoplatonist guy is now authoritative. Instead, uh, what Augustine does is um, despoil the Egyptians kind of thing, right? Where essentially you, the Origen and Augustine and Justin Martyr, uh, Christian writers who are proto-Orthodox or later, or Augustine's Orthodox. So they um, take the uh, Neoplatonic ideas and Christianize them. And so, th and so they're doing that within a context that becomes what the what the Orthodox community considers to not be heretical. And so the difference between that and this very elaborated additional scriptures that are late scriptures that include all of these you know, mythologies and everything like that, um, that's what kind of doesn't get left in. And so the fact that the Gnostics have a uh, new scripture that doesn't go all the way back, let's say, that starting with Valentinus and things like that, um, that's something that um, the bishops decide that they don't want to include. But that doesn't mean that they're not influenced by the ideas. They're all of them living in the Roman Empire, and so therefore um, their, their philosophical, their scientific background for how they view the universe is massively influenced, as we've seen by Plato and Aristotle uh, and everybody before and after them. And so as a result of that, um, they work that stuff in. And, and, and they work a bunch of these Gnostic ideas in too, even, you know. And yeah, it's Ivan. Were the Ebionites uh, uh, as uh, evangelical? Were, did they evangelize as much as uh, I sh uh, as? Excuse me. 
Was the Jacobist Church as evangelizing as yes. the Paulist? Apparently so. So uh, the idea of it is that um, uh, the, this, among the early Christian practices that maybe we're identifying here as central, so I've talked about this um, shared community of voluntary poverty, asceticism, and um, you know, saying the kind of the Lord's Prayer of you want to have give us our daily bread and 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 all the other things. The other commandment that is um, that's circulating early is um, sending out apostles in twos, and they're not supposed to take purse or scrip because again they're having this asceticism. But essentially they're going out to preach um, uh, the good news, so they're going out to evangelize, and they're also you know creating these communities as they go around. So that tradition is happening. And so that's, that's going all the way back to the earliest community um, that becomes centered on Jerusalem, but it begins in Galilee. Um, and so uh, presumably that was also continuing to happen. And so not all of these, uh, there are other early communities that I haven't, that we didn't touch on, right? So for example, um, there's the entire um, John, Johnine community, Johannine community. Uh, because we, know, we mostly know them because we have the, um, the Gospel of John and, and the Epistles of John. So these, this other community that's writing these texts, they're not, they're not Pauline, you know, so they're not kind of like from Paul's stuff and they aren't really from um, the, you know, the, the Jerusalem church. Essentially, it's a, it's a, Jude, it's a, it's a formerly Jewish, um, Jewish Christians that have been kicked out of the synagogues in Syria uh, and anyway, so, so they're also, and they're also doing this thing too. So there's multiple Christianities that are writing their own texts, but they are, like you say, converting. Yes. Yes. Certainly, I've heard examples. I don't claim to be an intellect, but um, all the other way, <laughs> I can't even hold the mind right. Um, I was just wondering, was this kind of a power grab? Was it a power grab? Um, I don't know. I mean, power. I mean, so there's there's evolution of institutions as things go on, uh, and and different people are have. I think people are very earnest about what they think that the true, um, the path should be done. Should be that should be followed, and what's essential to the the faith that they're professing very devoutly. And Paul has got a lot of conviction that what he's doing is he's very right in the and he's. He's empowered, and he considers himself an apostle of Jesus because of his vision, and of Christ because of his vision. And so, um, I, he, you know, what he, is what he's doing a power grab so that he can be in charge of churches? You know, I, it doesn't necessarily seem so, and, and likewise, not necessarily um, for the people in Jerusalem. They may well be thinking, who is this guy? <laughs> you know, he never knew Jesus. You know, he was not part of one of our group. He, was, he used to be a guy who was a very serious opponent of what we're doing, and now he's turned around and he's making his own churches. So they might have been, might be very concerned that um, he's spreading a false gospel or, or essentially he's a defrauding them by, um, you know, like identity theft kind of thing, right? And so they may, be they may be worried about that as opposed to a power grab where they're trying to make sure that the, the Jerusalem church is in charge of all these things. That said, I mean, ultimately, when there's institutions, there people are interested in, in power. I mentioned that um, it may well be that Marcion wanted to be pope. <laughs> Valentinus wanted to be pope, probably. Um, at least that's what the proto-Orthodox people who say bad things about them say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, and they, that, they, that they wanted a power grab and they didn't get it, and so they went off and took their marbles and, and made their own churches. You know, or they had a really strong belief of what they think it was supposed to be, and they were upset that the, uh, everybody rejected those ideas, and so then they went off and formed their own church. So you can look at it, the motives different ways. Yeah, back here. So can you pass the mic? Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, I, I was super interested in actually making the connection to Arianites as followers of Jesus, and, and I think what you're saying is like the proximity is very close and, and possibly even their heirs really and the closest heirs to Jesus' ministry. Uh -huh. um, what you didn't talk about that I thought I would just mention as a comment is that to me that, that continuation of Judaism that Ebionites continue really comes directly from the retention of Judaism that Jesus has in the Gospels. And yeah. even in Matthew, obviously, the observance of Torah, which he never gave up. Right. Um, 
and that ultimately Jesus' ministry was, for me, uh, uh, the story of Israel, the story of Israel's redemption, and that that sort of ethnic, religious, whatever connection is still very strong in the, in the Jerusalem church, and that's, I think, continues to give credence to the idea that the, the James church is, is absolutely the most representative of, the, of Jesus' ministry. It's just sort of a comment more than anything else. Yeah. Well, I think, I, I think it's hard to argue with that. <laughs> Um, it isn't the main line of what the whole thing became, but it is maybe more emblematic of what it had been, the most emblematic of what it would have been when Jesus was alive. Um, that's my, so I agree. And then back to Ivan, I guess. Perhaps one way of making a generalization of that, that blur of circles and, <laughs> and arrows is to look at the is to think of, uh, of some geographic locations. The followers of, Je- uh, uh, the followers of John and Jesus, the, the Jacobists who become Ebionites are, s- are centered in Jerusalem. Yep. But the other three layers of the Paulist, perhaps not the Paulist so much, but the Marcionites and the Gnostics are concentrated amongst the Jewish community outside of the Holy Land, but located especially where they're subject to Greek influences in uh, Alexandria. Right. So yeah, this is, these are definitely, uh, Alex, you know, like you say, Antioch, and then Alexandria, and and then let's say Pergamum. So like this area of Western Anatolia, you know, this is where, and then eventually Rome, because both Valentinus and Marcion actually both make it to Rome, and Paul, according to tradition, goes to Rome. But anyway, so like you say, it's the, uh, these guys stay uh, in the immediate area of, of Palestine and Judea um, and don't spread too much beyond that, although according to tradition, Peter, who's one of their group, uh, makes it to Rome as well, uh, Antioch and then Rome. We don't know, <laughs> maybe. And, um, but then, like you say, this spread that's happening much faster and larger is happening um, through the Greek speaking in the first place, like you say, the diaspora, but more importantly, ultimately, uh, the Jew- not than the Jewish diaspora, it's the Greek speaking people who are interested in Judaism, but, don't, but aren't, aren't living the law, right? So there's this group of people that are talked about in the, in the New Testament that are called the God-fearers, which are people that are um, intrigued by the antiquity of um, Jewish scripture and go to synagogues and things like that in all of the diaspora, the, the, the synagogues and the diaspora, the language is Greek. And so they're reading the scriptures uh, from the Septuagint from the Greek. And some of them, like uh, the Luke, for example, who's uh, not raised Jewish, um, knows nevertheless the Septuagint backwards and forward, just like crazy. You know, it's one of their best New Testament writers in terms of being able to make use of Septuagint, you know, just to say Bible stories. And so there's, and so probably uh, Luke is converted from among this group of people that are called the God-fearers, people who are already interested in Judaism but aren't living the law, right? So they're just going to synagogue and things like that. And there's a huge number of them, and these missionaries come, like Paul. <laughs> And he tells them, hey, this is good, good news. You know, you can be Israel. God, you know, God, Jesus has said essentially, you know, God can pick up a rocks and make them children of Abraham. <laughs> so that we are no longer Jew and Gentile, Paul says. We are one in Christ Jesus, right? And so you are Israel. You are the restored Israel. And so then this is, this is the innovation that allows all of these people who massively outnumber Jews um, to ultimately become like why there's so many more Christians you know, than everybody. Well, I, I was just, uh, in Alexandria, there was this enormous Greek intellectual yes. tradition. And what you find, and it certainly seems this, this way, as, as you go up, that, up, the, up those diagonals, you get a much more intellectual kind of Christianity. Yes. In fact, the, the, the the history that's positive between the, between um, between the eternity of the monad and of the pleroma yeah. and creation is is as if an enormous mind 
were only at work, yes. utterly immaterial there. Yes. And for example, in Valentinus's schema, he, the, the pre-existent is bathos, the abyss, who bring male, who brings forth uh, uh, silence. And they, they create 30 other, and for a total of 34 other aeons here, last of whom is the female uh, Sophia yep. and her concert design. But these are intellectual things. They right. entirely, enti it's as if so it has a huge, like you say, in reflection. Yeah, but this has divorced. a huge appeal to, like you say, this intellectual community that's in Alexandria, where these texts are being written. And this is there's no no, like you say, that's the reason why we found them in Egypt for one of the things. You know, they're in Coptic because this, they're popularized there in Egypt, and all of this stuff would be so completely alien to um, the the peasant. Uh, population of Galilee, the people who are following the historical Jesus around and who are interested in things like where he's saying, you know, cancel, cancel the debts. <laughs> you know, so we need to, um, you know, regular peasant workers, tenant farmers, all of their debts need to be, to be forgiven as we forgive our debtors or something like that. That's the kind of thing that, um, you know, like a generation before, two gener three generations before or whatever, this is where the movement is starting. Now, by the time it gets to Alexandria, like you say, this is a very different animal because it's among a very different group of people. So guys, we're going to call it quits there. <laughs> so thank everybody for <laughs> turning in on the, online. Appreciate it so much. <laughs>